Okay, we're gonna get started. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Christine Clark, Associate Director of Health and Human Sciences at the University of Chicago. Health and Human Sciences includes our Master of Science in Biomedical Informatics program and our Master of Science in Threat and Response Management. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We have a great group of students here in person and some friends of the program. We also have a group of people joining us live stream. So thank you all for your time to listen in to what I know will be an interesting and um, informative lecture and discussion. We work with our instructors, partners, and larger community to bring co-curricular programming to our students. Um, things like the, our biomedical informatics seminar series, our threat response management guest lectures, and we're able to share some of these events with prospective students as well. Um, for anyone who's considering enrolling in our programs, tonight we have our Assistant Director of Enrollment Management, Kelsey Diaz, in the back of the room over here. So if anyone has a question about um, admissions or our programs in general, Kelsey will be happy to talk to you. You may also make an appointment with Kelsey online at a later date. Tonight we've invited Mr. Bobby Bacci and Dr. Devin Mehta to speak to you. I recently heard Mr. Bacci talk at a healthcare conference and was intrigued by the topic that he presented. He and his friend and colleague, Devin Mehta, worked together to improve healthcare in Haiti after the devastating uh, earthquake in 2010. I think it's a terrific case study um, intersecting both fields of study, healthcare and emergency management. I know you'll learn much hearing about their careers and experiences working together. So we're happy to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. I'll provide you all with a short bio for each of our speakers and then let them tell you more about themselves during the presentation. We'll also save a few minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A. We'll be using social Q&A. So we have the URL here and the code to join and pose a question. Um, you can upvote questions as well. And the information should also be appearing for those who are um, joining by live stream. Dr. Devin Mehta is an advanced heart failure cardiologist. He specializes in caring for community heart failure patients, where his focus is device-guided hemodynamic management, improving quality of life in end-stage heart failure, and bridging patients to centers for mechanical circulatory support, left ventricular assist devices, and heart transplantation. Dr. Mehta is the founder of Global Health Coalition, a nonprofit whose mission is to bring modern health technologies to developing countries to accelerate improvement of health outcomes using a data-driven approach. Mr. Bobby Bacci is the founder and CEO of Prominence Advisors, a healthcare IT firm focused on helping the nation's leading healthcare organizations do more with their data. He has led Prominence to support over 70 healthcare organizations, including seven of the top 10 hospitals in the US and fostered a culture that has been recognized as a great place to work by multiple outlets each year. Mr. Bacci also serves as a board member for Global Health Coalition. Gentlemen. Right. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having us. Um, so it's clear to me now that we probably took the long way uh, to get to this place to even begin trying to make an impact. I think uh, my interest in global health began uh, as, a, as a child, traveling to India, seeing poverty, uh, seeing what life was like there. And when I had the opportunity uh, in between medical school and residency to go to Malawi and um, see a hospital there that was uh, treating patients during malaria season, children with uh, cerebral malaria, and there were a few trained doctors and medical students uh, from the UK and Scotland and, and the US and myself in Chicago. And uh, these kids were seizing. Uh, there was no power, it would go out and uh, we had to crack these bottles and uh, give uh, Ativan to try to break a seizure. And I had never done that before. Um, in, uh, in the UK, they train and go to medical school uh, a little bit more accelerated than we do here. And um, so they were much beyond my skill level and I was just trying to keep up and uh, we were taking babies and piling them and people were bagging them and moving them because the power would go out, oxygen would cut off and we were just doing the best we can and it was totally and completely overwhelming. Um, and I knew that I had a difficult feat coming back because um, I've always been cerebral in thinking, and the question was, is how do you make an impact in, uh, in the world today? Is it sort of big picture? Is it a small idea with a big impact? Or is it um, 
Is it sort of one man, one patient at a time? And I struggle with that even today. And I kept going through medical school and internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship, advanced heart failure uh, training. And uh, now I'm the director of a heart failure program in a community hospital in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago. And um, I find that what I'm most driven to um, is sort of that ability to manage a population. And I think that's uh, what led me uh, deeper in this rabbit hole of what we'll talk to you about. Mm. Uh, I took a much more roundabout way uh, to getting into uh, global health. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in Chicago. I went to school at uh, Penn State. I studied finance and engineering and entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, the jo- one of the jobs I got offered coming out of school was with Epic Systems. And Epic is one of the nation's leading electronic medical record vendors out of Madison, Wisconsin. And so I uh, didn't know anything about healthcare. Uh, they, they, they hire people kind of from... Uh, all different types of backgrounds, and then they teach them how to go in and implement and configure um, their software. Uh, I got hired as a project manager. I didn't, I didn't really know what I was going to be doing until I got there, and then they figured out I was going to actually be configuring software for hospitals. And so, I kind of backdoored into into healthcare um, and uh, and learned a lot. And, and through that process, I, I uh, you know, I was helping large hospital systems get rid of paper and and put an electronic system in place, and learned all about the impacts of that. Um, when I left Epic, uh, I decided to start a uh, Prominence, which is the company um, that I that I own now, and uh, and we work today with large hospital organizations to help them implement their uh, their electronic medical records. And then we've we've created a software platform that sits on top of all of the data they're collecting, aggregates it, transforms it. Um, there's a bunch of pre-built content in it to help them get from A to B faster, uh, and deploy that. And so so our goal is, uh, you know, and what we do as a company is helping hospitals. Uh, leverage that data to take better care of patients, um, operate more efficiently, uh, and things like that. And um, and and so it's kind of uh, Devin and I have actually known each other since third grade. So uh, it's it's quite coincidental that uh, our 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 paths intersected uh, in healthcare. And uh, and and kind of my first vision into uh, global health, and uh, and and kind of some of the eye opening. Uh, experiences of how great the the chasm of care, that disparity of care between the the care that we appreciate here and uh, people in rural communities and developing countries, really came from Devin. I, you know, I think we were at, actually at my wife's birthday party, and he was telling me about um, about some of his travels and some of his experiences in, in global health, and that's really what kind of started to pique my interest. Um, and I think you know, as we go through this presentation today, uh, you'll start to see how. His experiences and uh, in his skill set and my experiences and skill set kind of weaved themselves together um, to try to figure out how to how to how to solve try to solve a problem that we saw that existed and so uh, to kick this off I think um, this is a sobering uh, statistic but it's 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 pertinent to kind of I, I think uh, put out there as a foundation uh, for this conversation and that's the 3.75 billion people. That's half the world's population don't have access to essential healthcare services. So you know, if you think about being able to go outside this building, you know, you probably couldn't walk more than two blocks without getting to three pharmacies, uh, being able to buy over-the-counter drugs, being able to uh, even within those pharmacies see a primary care physician. You know, that's not the reality of 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 uh, healthcare on a global scale. Um, that's 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 uh, you know kind of uh, the pinnacle of what many people um, could hope to experience, um, and so uh, the story that we're going to tell today is 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 the other side of that coin. It's people that uh, have absolutely no access to um, to care, um, and uh, and some of the circumstances that may have brought them there, and so thought a really uh, just a, a cool way to start this off would um, I read into it was. Right around 2015, when uh, Devin came back um, from Haiti and shared his story with me, and we we kind of started thinking about this idea of of, of global health coalition and how we may be able to make um, an impact, even a small impact. Because you know, when you look at that 3.75 billion people, you know, where do you start? That's like standing at the bottom of Everest and looking up and being like, how do I get to the top? And sometimes you just have to start taking one step at a time. And all of a sudden, when you turn around, you know, you're, you're much higher than you, you ever would have expected possible. And so that would be cool to have Devin start off and uh, tell this kind of this, the same story he told me. Um, and then we can, you know, we can take it from there. So. 
This is a picture of Port-au-Prince after the 2010 earthquake. It was January 2010, 7.0 uh, earthquake, and it shattered the lives of, of thousands across the city. And um, I was in medical school at Rush Medical Center in Chicago, and some physicians uh, flew down to the Dominican Republic, and they were working down there uh, prior to 2010. And they, uh, they hopped in cars, and they went to the border of uh, the DR in Haiti. And um, uh, there was just rows. There was rows of cars to get over. Uh, they did what they had to do, and along with other medical providers, and they crossed into the border, went into Port-au-Prince. Uh, they were helping with wounds, helping with uh, prevention of sort of acute illnesses from becoming sort of endemic. And um, that's how the story starts. Um, this is a slide that sort of depicts uh, the amount of people that were affected after the 2010 earthquake and the response. Um, you can see on the bottom left hand of the slide uh, the, um, the trillions of uh, US GDP and that of Haiti and the amount of uh, response aid that was provided it was really marginal for, uh, for, for the immense problem that needs to be had. I think this slide depicts what happened not only in Haiti, you know, the younger people being affected uh, more so than older. Uh, imagine young kids losing their homes, losing their parents. Uh, they have nowhere to go, and, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a generational issue. It, it cripples sort of the future of a country, of a, of a city, for, for years to come. And I think this is not unique to just a, a, an earthquake in Haiti. Uh, they've had natural disasters prior to that that has really um, uh, made the country a struggle to try to improve. Um, I think it's throughout the Middle East, you know, when there's, uh, whether it's man-made war, natural disaster, um, all I think about as a provider is those healthcare systems that are just crippled. Their, you know, their infrastructures are taken away, roads are blocked, uh, you know, UN aid agencies are blocked from being able to provide care, um, and there's doctors that are making a difference in those hospitals and uh, they're doing the best they can with limited resources. This is, um, this is a, a picture of the drive out from Port-au-Prince to the village of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, they renamed sort of certain geographic areas after this um, based on the new populations that were forming because Port-au-Prince was really uninhabitable, many of those areas that were uh, damaged by the earthquake. And, People were moving outward from the city, and the farther out you go from this populous city, is, uh, is uh, there's less and less resources. There's less access to clean water, less access to electricity, and less access to healthcare. And people were building tent cities, and um, there were vans of, of docs and medical students and nurses going out there to try to provide care. Here's a picture of one of the tent cities. You can see that the, uh, you know, the earlier you get there, it's more advantageous to be at the bottom of the hill. Uh, the farther up you go, the darker it is at night, the farther you have to go to, to get to water or to get down to get to transportation. This is right around 2014. Uh, they uh, started building, you know, each individual family would try to build up their own home and um, uh, some aid was coming in. And they started to build homes and, and uh, declare properties. It never really made it that far. Uh, even in 2020, um, it doesn't look all that much different. Some of these buildings are half built and still don't have roofs. And they're still, uh, uh, the, the community's growing in population. Um, so around 2015, I go down with a medical team, and uh, we're providing health care. Uh, we, we're staying in Port-au-Prince. We all hop in a van, and we go down there, and uh, there's, just a, there's just a group of people just waiting for, for health care. Down the street, there's an orphanage. Um, Madame Lafleur took in probably about 20 kids to start that she found on the streets of Port-au-Prince. Her husband left her for doing it. Uh, he, she and her kid uh, took in about 20, and she's grown it to over 50 kids today that she's raised from about the age of four. Some are going off to uh, college or going to find work now. It's down the street from the Jerusalem community, 
and the doctors uh, at Rush Medical Center uh, began to build infrastructure of health, and that's where I contributed. And we were providing care to hundreds of people that were waiting. Um, we showed up to this community center. If, and just real yeah. quick, if I can, if I can interject, Please. you know, when I went down there, um, <clears throat> and we went, we visited the orphanage, and there was there was there was at least a hundred kids when we went to visit. You know, you always think about going to an orphanage and feeling really sad for the children that are there, and, and I did, and I'm a parent, I have a couple of kids. Um, but when I walked out of that orphanage, I couldn't figure out who was, who, who I was more concerned for, the children outside the orphanage or the children inside the orphanage. And I think that just kind of really speaks volumes to uh, kind of the, the destitute nature of this, of, of this community, um, because at least the children inside the orphanage had three square meals and sanitary conditions and there was walls and uh, you know and they'd put up barbed wire around the top to 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 keep um, uh, uh, you know uh, people with malintentions out and things like that and so I think you know just to kind of help kind of illustrate you know the um, you know even so long after the disaster still kind of that, that the dysfunction and the danger within the community so and despite that lifeline even today, I think we still ask what happens, you know, when, when they get old enough to leave the orphanage. And I think it's yet to be, yet to be seen. Um, so imagine us in this open air church, community center, uh, uh, medical clinic now, you know, in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of this sort of dry landscape. And we get off the bus and it's my first day there and first day learning about Port-au-Prince and uh, the real uh, aftermath of the earthquake and there's hundreds of people just waiting in a line um, so we unpacked the bus every day we packed everything in the back of the bus we had medical supplies a makeshift pharmacy uh, we had paper medical records and suitcases we had ivs we had poles to hang the ivs and we s put about 12 providers uh, scattered throughout the room and we made our own little process to to check these patients in, get them ID cards, go to station one, then you go to station two, then you go to the pharmacy, uh, you tell the pharmacist, uh, which was a dentist, you know, what meds you want. He would sort of give those back to you and, the, and then they would go on and we were giving out Tylenol and Gatorade and in addition to those things. And if there was an acute condition, we had to sort of take him to the side, do the best we could. Um, eventually, a Haitian physician, a couple years later, got linked in where if there was something we needed, transfer to a hospital for, they could at least a week later make a phone call to make sure the patient got there. Um, I, was, I was disheartened, to say the least. I was just starting my medical career. Um, we were using electronic medical records in the States, and I was in a place where I couldn't understand longitudinally what was happening to a patient. You know, I beg to question the difference we were making. It was hard to see uh, when, you're, when you're seeing scribbles written on a paper and you're, you're trying to understand how are we gonna get out of this? Um, how are we gonna get them, you know, to stay healthy so maybe they can make a better life for themselves? And, um, and it, was, uh, it was really difficult to come back to all the luxuries that we have here and go to medical school then and learn about all these unique treatments for disease processes and all I'm thinking about is, uh, is, is clean water, access to health care, you know, or putting a roof over someone's head, electricity to be able to read maybe so they can educate themselves or get education to pull their next generation out of this poverty. That's when I came back and, um, and I met Bobby. It is, uh, it is what now I recall is, is your wife's birthday to say, uh, this is what I saw and this is what I think we need to do. Yeah, and, uh, and, and so, um, <clears throat> you know, when Devin came back, uh, you know, and was telling me about this story, he said, um, you know, he kind of, you know, threw out the challenge and said, hey, um, you know, do you think it's possible, you know, to, to create, you know, an electronic system that we could care for these patients in? Um, you know, we don't know what kind of supplies we need. You know, before they would go down on one of these trips, they'd go and they'd just pack bags with whatever they thought they needed. Uh, you know, we don't know how many pediatric patients we're seeing. We don't know how many female patients we're seeing. We don't know how many male patients we're seeing. We don't know 
uh, you know what the uh, what the what the uh, key chief complaints are. You know, uh, do we bring down family practice doctors? Do we bring down OBGYNs? You know, do we who do we recruit? You know, do we bring down cardiologists? Who do we recruit to try to treat this population? We knew next to nothing about this population because when all of the information that you're trying to leverage to make decisions is on paper it's almost impossible to continue to try to compile uh, all of that data into, um, into a model that'll help, you, um, that'll help you make better decisions. And so, you know, these are, these are a lot of the limitations of a, of a paper system. You know, uh, the, the productivity is down. Um, you know, it, just thinking about trying to read somebody else's writing. Um, uh, uh, accessibility is next to zero, right? Only one person can hold that paper record at a time. Um, uh, multiple people can't be looking at the same information. Uh, the quality is low because you can't leverage any computational power to try to check for errors or mistakes that are very clear. And there's uh, fragmentation in the care that you're delivering um, to people because there's there's no um, there's no collaboration. And so you know these are the you know this is what drove the development of an electronic rec record here. And you only see these things amplified when you're in a situation um, uh, uh, trying to treat patients like, like, like we were down in the community there. And so, um, and so you know, I, I you know, first question, I'm like, sure, we could, you know, I'm sure we could do this, we could build this system. I was like, so, you know, um, uh, like, you know, what's the power situation? He's like, there is no power. And, uh, and so the next question is like, all right, so, you know, what, what about Wi-Fi? You know, there is no Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, so so you're you're talking about creating. Uh, so now you know the situation is starting to become a little bit more clear. You know, you're talking about creating a completely offline system that can still create a network so that everybody working on that EMR system can communicate together and can uh, collaborate. Um, and it has to be able to stay powered for at least 18 hours out in the field. Um, and so, and, 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 um, and, and so, you know, that, that's really kind of where the problem solving got interesting. And so, um, you know, I, I hit on the first two barriers, um, but, you know, you also have no IT infrastructure, right? And so I think part of the, the, the grander vision here is, well, if we have information on these patients, then, you know, we can leverage that data, not just when we're here, but potentially when we're not here to continue to drive change. Um, you know, uh, you have to try to figure out the hardware and the software that you're going to develop this on. You know, most large hospital organizations will spend upwards of half a billion dollars to implement a system like Epic. You know, uh, we're talking about doing this with a couple of hundred, right? And so how do you find software and hardware that's going to support a budget to make this a scalable solution um, to get into rural communities? Um, you know, you have to um, you have to think about training. You know, uh, you know, electronic medical records are are highly complex because um, you have people of many different disciplines working together. You know, you have people uh, uh, taking vitals. You know, you have doctors writing notes. You have multiple people doing assessments. You have labs coming in. You're trying to get medications in the hands of the patients. You have to register them. Right, you have to get all of their demographic information in there. Um, so you have to think about the workflow, and then you have to develop the system to align with that workflow. Um, and uh, and and then you have to train the people that are coming down to do that. All the people that come down and that are going to be using the system are volunteers, right? And they're they're very busy. So you have to think about how can we make this this system so simple that it's very intuitive to learn because we're never going to get time from these patients until basically like the night they land in Haiti to make sure that they can show up the next day and they can rock on the system. And, um, and then you have to think about maintenance, right? Um, you know, the, the ideal outcome would be for this system to be ingrained within the people that are delivering care so that they could continue to use it even when the volunteers are not down there. Uh, they can continue to aggregate this information, um, and uh, and so, um, but with no IT infrastructure, with uh, you know, uh, you have to th all that has to go into you know the design of this system, so that's basically maintenance free, right? Um, to be successful in the long run, to be scalable. 
And so, um, and so, it, I'll, I'll kind of hand it back to Dev here because he he did a, a lot of the legwork up front, um, helping kind of guide us through the in really being our quarterback, guiding us through this this problem solving, and and getting from point A to point B. But you know, it starts with the needs assessment, right? Going down, putting boots on the ground. Really, you you know, you can't solve a problem until you're in the space that you're trying to solve a problem until you're in that area until you kind of you know can put you know use your eyes and your ears and, and all of your senses to understand uh how you know how this is going to be de deployed that site you know that that site assessment is really critical um, you have to select the software you have to select the hardware um, uh, you know, you have to think about the deployment, and what was really key for both of us um, is 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 data and analytics. I think at the end of the day, the system was kind of a means to the end for us, right? Um, what we really wanted was to be able to answer questions like, were we making a difference? How could we make a bigger difference? But you can't do any of that without data, and so the goal of designing this system was to get the information in an electronic format, so that we could then make decisions, better decisions, and make a bigger impact. Um, and so that was really kind of, you know, what we were what we were building up to. And so maybe Dev, I'll, I'll pass it back to you and you can kind of talk through, um, you know, that process and, and, and put a little bit more color on each one of those steps. So we started, uh, you know, there's a, <laughs> I'll pause. So I read this great book by Muhammad Yunus. So he, he founded the Grameen Bank and is a father of micro let it credit, credit and financing. And uh, the whole concept is that those small changes sort of can help pull people out of poverty. And I think one thing that I took away from that and I've always carried it forward is that, you know, when we set out to build something, our goal wasn't to sell products, our goal wasn't to generate revenue. You know, we set out to solve a problem. You know, and the way we went about then this step, this method of implementation was really to understand the people that the EMR was going into, the people that would be using it, um, and the problems that we wanted to solve. Um, and so you see this generator that was there. On first thought, I thought, yeah, you know, we can just get our generator down there and we can, we can uh, power a clinic using that and we can power the EMR until we learn that sort of the power that comes out of there is sort of dirty power. And it, it, the technology that we were using didn't really support the gaps in a generator lapsing. Um, and even if the generator was on, you're, you're still seeing this sort of dirty power and you're unable to translate that to a continuous wireless connection. So, you know, we kind of put the stop on that um, and we learned what they were already doing at the clinic, uh, the things they were using, like these ID cards. Um, and so being down there was helpful. Um, we understood uh, how many people they were seeing, where they were coming from, uh, what their professions were, what level of education they had, how many medical teams we'd be dealing with. And we realized that we're really setting out to build a sort of mobile EMR that could be taken down from the U.S. to Haiti, sort of dropped, uh, opened up by someone who may not be familiar with the system, unroll it, uh, deploy it, and then it be used by a team that's may never see it again because they may not go back there and a new medical team might come three months later uh, and the system needs to be carried back and then we'd have to extract that data so as bobby said we could kind of do the best we could with it and so we found we landed on actually an open source system uh, open mrs and bomney uh, rather than creating our own emr we thought that we'd tap into a community of people that are using this software um, then we realized that it's very complex. And with these teams going down with such short stays and with short training episodes, that we actually had to take a complex EMR and we had to scale it back. So we're the ones uh, taking this beautiful product now, taking features away from it to make it work for us. And uh, we use Tableau uh, through Bobby's expertise uh, with, uh, with data analytics and visualization. Uh, we, we, we scoured the internet looking for low cost, uh, energy efficient solutions to use as part of our EMR system. So the way we do it is, uh, is daisy chaining a couple uh, portable AC battery packs to a router, because everything else you see up there has got a battery, except for the router. Um, and so the router needs power, set up a local area network uh, in a room, any room, medical clinic, and uh, we have one server, it's a laptop, 
that has external battery packs that can be swapped. There's an internal battery on the laptop, so it's sort of hot swappable, so it never loses power, because that's the key to the whole system. And then each provider in the pharmacy has a Chromebook. It costs about $183 on Amazon and will last about 12 hours. So our system uh, is uh, low cost, uh, it works, and uh, extremely energy efficient. How much did the whole thing cost? Like Hardware-wise? The whole thing costs, uh, I'd have to calculate in my head, probably about $3,000 for an electronic micro record. Uh, that was me, Bobby, and Sella uh, with the whole system in a TSA-approved uh, carry-on luggage. Uh, and, and so everyone's like, why are you guys guarding that with, uh, <laughs> with your lives? So that's, a, that's what we're going to use for the electronic medical record. So we took it in the clinic and we trained, uh, we trained local Haitians how to sort of unpack this, how to set it up, and it was very simple to do. That's the night before uh, our first deployment down there um, at a hostel in Port-au-Prince, training the providers that had just gotten down how to use the system, making sure they can log in. Um, it's pretty user, the user interface is extremely friendly. Um, and uh, by day three, uh, you can see one of the community members uh, with a laptop registering patients. Uh, and uh, I think people were amazed. They thought it would take months for us to train locals to be able to use the system. By the end of the week, we were stepping back and other people were excited and engaged and they wanted to use it to, to enroll patients and, and, and see what it could do. So I touched on the deployment here. It's a, it's a graphical depiction of the wireless router sort of setting up this local area network uh, powered by battery. And it, it provides uh, the, uh, the communication between the Chromebooks and the server laptop. So the Chromebooks actually don't store any data. Um, the server laptop does. And uh, that can be carried back to a place with Wi-Fi, like uh, in the city center in Port-au-Prince. And the data can be then uploaded back to the states where we can work on the analytics. Um, these are some screenshots of the system. We, uh, every deployment we do uh, to different health clinics, um, uh, you know, they, we match our software and the EMR to match the workflow of the community and of the clinic. And I think that's very unique in what we do. I, you know, the stories I was telling you, uh, it's because I think we take pride in understanding the people and the, and the healthcare workers that are gonna be there and what they need to succeed and that's how we can build our system. And that sort of nature of being able to modify this is really the beauty of it. And if I could just real quick on that, that last slide, I think what's, what's really unique about um, the approach that we've taken, it, you know, at least for me, you know, I, I make a living going in and, and, and basically configuring EMRs and making them more complex, adding customizations, making them unique to doctors like Devin so that they can treat patients their way. Each one of these is basically, uh, in the EMR, there is one page for everybody that's filling a role, one page for uh, for, for registering somebody, one page for taking vitals, one page for taking notes and placing medication orders, one page for um, labs, and one page for pharmacy. So there is, so, so, you know, part of what made it so easy is we, um, I think, were fanatical about slashing everything that was not mission critical. Um, and, and, what, and, and the way that we made those decisions was what data do we need? to make decisions. If we don't need that data, if that data is not going to lead towards providing a higher quality of care, um, or then, then, then it's superfluous and it's going to make the system harder. Um, and so we actually had to go through a lot of work um, to take that kind of open source system and um, detach a lot of the functionality from it to make it. But that's what made it so easy to use. That's what made it intuitive. That's what kind of helped make it stick. Um, and people said, hey, it's actually, you know, even the people, uh, the community members that continue to use it after we left, so this is easier and better than paper, um, and so you know. But the but, but we got there because it, it, it made their job faster and, 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 and easier, and it was simply just by by pushing for simplicity. So, and I think we started you know we started with the EMR. We improved workflows, improved efficiency in the clinic, made it easier to prescribe medications. We thought we made it safer, and uh, then we had to prove it. And so uh, this is where we uh, got to work. Uh, using Tableau and other data visualization applications to, to, to look at 
the care we were providing, analyze it, and help the, uh, the, the stakeholders of those clinics you know, make decisions. Who to send down, when, you know, what drugs are needed, what are we actually treating, what are the most common diagnoses. Um, is, it, is it that we're seeing uh, high blood pressure in disproportionate rates, which we were. You know, it actually led to a study where we're looking at sort of the BMI of patients and uh, their rates of blood pressure. And it's interesting because it's not what you would expect. You know, we're seeing thin, thin people with really high blood pressures. Um, and uh, there's this disparity and um, that was presented at a national conference. So we're learning a lot. And I think the people that are now interacting with our system are learning a lot about the community and it's allowing them to make better decisions. Um, so I'll hand it off to you to sure. talk a little bit more about some of the analytics and yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know our goal. Our goal with this data was to was to automate um, the collection of it, um, and uh, and 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 help us answer um, questions. And I think you know if I if I summarize at a high level, you know what what I've internalized you know through this journey is that when we create data where no data exists today, we're creating a bridge to connect those that are currently unconnected. And so you know with this data we were able to connect this community, this resettlement community in Haiti um, to our healthcare system. You know, we were able to start taking this data and providing it to physicians here who could then look at this patient data and, uh, and they could start um, recommending interventions from abroad. They could talk to the community members down there and said, hey, you know, this patient's at risk of a stroke. We should go check in on them and see if there's preventative care or preventative measures that we can take um, to try to um, to try to avert the worst case scenario and so um, and uh, in in the second um, takeaway is that uh, sometimes the uh, most elegant solution to a really complex problem is the most simple so you know when you you know when I when I first started off and we're talking about creating an electronic medical record without power without internet you know you, you know you might just sit there and be like yeah, this isn't going to happen. And then, you know, after working through it, you know, we get to a solution that now I think, you know, we can replicate for $1,500. Um, and it's really just a local area network with a slimmed down software uh, that's allowing people to collaborate in the way they work. Um, and then it's, and then we've automated, you know, a visualization of the data that's helping drive decisions, right? It seems so simple, like once the problem's solved. And, um, and, 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 uh, and uh, it's taught me to kind of look at uh, all kinds of problems in life a lot different, which is sometimes the simplest solution can, can be the best. Um, and so, you know, what's next? Uh, so, so, you know, all this work that we did um, has been driven through Global Health Coalition, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization um, that we created. And so um, uh, the work that we did down in Haiti was in collaboration with Rush Global Health. Um, and, uh, and we're uh, now partnering with another nonprofit called One World Surgery. Um, they operate out of Ecuador and the Dominican Republic, and they provide surgeries. Uh, they have surgeons that go down and provide surgeries to patients that otherwise never would have um, the means or the resources um, to get critical life-altering um, um, care. And so they're gonna be deploying uh, a, uh, a slightly modified version of the electronic medical record that we developed within the, ho they're actually building hospitals, but within the hospitals. Um, again, the value that they saw in that was that it was a, sim a simple economical solution um, that was uh, you know, kind of what they needed and not a lot of what they didn't need that would provide the data that they, that they were looking for. Um, uh, I kind of mentioned the ability to take this data and connect patients in these communities with physicians that um, uh, they never otherwise uh, would have been able to be connected to. You know, uh, I think we're keeping a really close eye on um, the ability to provide telehealth to people within these rural communities. You know, as you get closer and closer to uh, global and satellite internet, um, and uh, really right now, any, almost any uh, any diagnostics that you want out of a patient, you can drive off your cell phone, whether you want to um, listen to somebody's heartbeat or see an EKG or see a, um, uh, uh, 
uh, a, a sonar image of a pregnant woman, you know, you can grab all this data, we can pump that data into a simple EMR that acts as, you know, kind of that collection point for all of that data, provide that to a physician in the United States, and then provide a FaceTime to get that person in front of a specialist that they never would have seen. And also, we can start to recruit more highly qualified physicians to do that because they don't have to get on a plane to help. You know, give us one hour a week of your free time to try to help somebody that you're uniquely qualified to help that doesn't have access to the help they need. Um, so that's really exciting for us. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and one more thing that we're, we're thinking more and more about is, um, you know, uh, how can we work with more nonprofits that are providing critical care like this in rural communities, give them the platform to collect data, and then aggregate that data together in a de-identified manner, treat it with respect the same way we treat patients' data in the United States, but then drive research off of that to start to create a global population uh, health picture and start to really drill into um, some, of the, in, uh, some of the things that might be creating and impacting um, you know, longevity and care uh, in these rural communities. Um, I think that's important. You know, when I was at the CDC and we were tracking cases of polio in Pakistan, you, know, you realize that it's the data points, right? So when we see these data dark populations, like the ones we're describing, you know, and there's people like you that are gonna go off and uh, you, you're gonna make decisions and you're gonna drive funds towards certain causes or you're gonna drive, uh, key decisions that make an impact, unless you know about these populations, unless we know what the diseases are and who these people are and have a narrative around them, you know, then the folks driving funds and making decisions won't be able to reach them. You know, so um, I, think that, uh, I think that connecting and building, building a platform where they can all connect is, is, is one of the most important things we can do. Um, and so uh, Devin's a humble guy, so he never would have put this up there, but I created the PowerPoint, so I put it up there, But because I like this quote. And, uh, and so Devin actually came when we started this charity, and he gave a presentation uh, to all my employees, because a lot of my employees volunteer to, to help with some of our efforts. And, and what he said was, you know, if you want to make a difference, if you want to make an impact, uh, doing do what you do best. And I think, you know, where I found so much passion in this is I was actually able to use the skill set that I had built through my profession to make a difference. It wasn't like I was volunteering to be a bookkeeper for the charity to try to crunch foundations or, 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 or hitting the phone and making calls. Like, yeah, maybe making calls to try to raise funds is important, um, but that's not how I could make the greatest impact. And so when you think about making an impact, think about what your skill set is and then use that and that's how you're gonna move mountains. Um, and so, uh, and so, and so, I think that's 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 what we'll leave you guys with. And um, happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for that really interesting talk. Um, one thing I was running to speak more to. Um, I was wondering for the open source software, um, the EMR, the BotMe, and the OpenMRI. Yeah. Um, did you work with those companies to, like, if they customize their securities, or did you take the open source, you took the code yourself, you redid it for what you made yourself? And, if, and like, in both, whichever way you did it, how did you go about that in more depth? Yeah. Yeah, so OpenMRS is a, it's a large open source EMR that was founded by the Reagan Grief Institute and Partners in Health, Paul Farmer's group, and um, uh, Bomni is a smaller group out of India. Uh, a company that built that, that is a layer that sits over it. And so we did take the open source uh, software and uh, we enlisted sort of experts that had worked within this platform and environment in other countries and with other organizations. And so we continuously are hands-on making these customizations and approving them as we go. So it's a very hands-on approach to customizing the EMR to fit the need of our partners. So you uh, worked with some of the software development experience, but not necessarily from that company itself. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so it, it started with you know kind of you know uh, 
us and folks from my company that had uh, technical capabilities jumping in and making the configurations. And then as we started catching traction and getting into more complex changes or changes that just had a deadline and milestone that we needed to move, we started pulling in some outside assistance as well to make those um, those configuration changes. But those have been driven through um, you know, like individuals and contractors or freelancers and things like that that have built a skill set in that code base that, that are that are efficient in it. And the companies themselves uh, don't. Um, uh, the company is ThoughtWorks that uh, that now I think distributes Bomni. They don't make the customizations themselves, but there's a large org uh, there's a large sort of group of people that interact on forums and they share code and share you know, little widgets that they're using and, uh, and there's conferences annually that they go to to try to uh, work together. So it's really a community of people that are using this open source platform to meet their needs. Yeah, and I think that's the beauty of an open source system, right? We looked at many, you know, systems that we could go buy um, and there was just, it was, it was costly, it wasn't economical and we couldn't make it what we thought we needed to make it. And so, you know, with that open source platform, it allowed us to go in and, uh, you know, we got a lot of flack for wanting to strip functionality that people have been waiting for years to get added into it or that had been working. Um, but we were able to make it unique to our, our, our situation. And frankly, I think we felt it wasn't sustainable to take a proprietary yeah. EMR to a partner, uh, whereas if it's open source, they, you know, it can live on. Yeah. So after it was being implemented, um, you know, on the ground, how were you handling um, responses to either issues or um, you know new features that were requested that might not initially been foreseen? And how often were you shipping new new versions of the software that you guys had worked on developing? That's a good question. Yeah, so we make uh, we so we have a a cloud based sort of staging and development platform where we're continuously making additions to and testing them and making sure that our partners like how that looks and then uh, we sort of can remotely uh, install those updates and I think uh, for the troubleshooting uh, we've began to train uh, locals uh, for each deployment um, because a hands-on piece is, is, is nice and it's comfortable for everyone but we can do much of what we do remotely. And uh, you know, just to expand on that a little bit, because you probably, you know, some folks might be saying, "Well, there's no internet in this, in this community. So how are you pushing this?" We're actually paying somebody to take that lap, that server laptop, and plug it into a LAN cord, and then bring it back to push those down. Which That's is, where knowing the community is, you know, yeah. is a big thing because we're really, I mean, at the grassroots for each deployment, you know, we're 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 meeting the needs of the community. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, one of the questions kind of addresses that. How, you know, make developing a system like this, collecting the data, how is that making a difference? You talked about it a little bit in your presentation, but I imagine it's also super helpful for the people that are staying there after you leave, that you have the system for them to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, I can expand on that a little. I, I think it's just, uh, you know, there's, um, we are able to raise awareness. Um, uh, so, so there's, so first there's a preparedness, right? We actually know who to recruit to go down there to volunteer now. Uh, like, uh, you know, over 60% uh, of the people um, that come in are women. And, uh, you know, like 10 to 15% of them were, were pregnant and had never had a checkup of any kind. And so we were recruiting, you know, a lot more OBGYNs to come down. We, we learned about the high blood pressure so we could start recruiting more cardiologists that could come down and try to um, provide interventions. We know what types of supplies to bring to, tr uh, to treat people. But also, we can take all of that data and we can um, we can recruit additional people here to help. And so, I think those are a few of the key ways that 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 some of that data is helping. Yeah, amazing that there was also a research study that was developed out of out of that work too. Yeah. Um, one of the questions is, if I was pulling together a rapid response team, what is the skill set, non medical, that might be needed to make this work and be efficient? A big one, I think, is is sort of logistics. I think for a non a non medical, uh, but in sort of uh, threat disaster response management, I think logistics is is big coordination of of everything, not just coordination of care, but coordination of of taking care of people in an emergency. I think that's an important skill set. And if you wanted to give advice to students who are interested in advancing efforts like these, what would you suggest? Um. You know, I, I think I gave the best advice that I had, you know, kind of at, at the end, which was, you know, don't try to don't try to help 
um, you know, by, by diffusing the true skill to, that you have, you know, be honest with yourself and what you're good at and apply that skill set to try to make a difference um, and, uh, and, 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 and try to focus on the simplest solution first um, as opposed to going to a complex solution. But I, I think those are the two best pieces of advice I could give. I don't know if you have anything else to add. I think to expound on that is to is to deep dive in. I mean, I think it took me three medical trips over a decade to be able to start to understand the problem. You know, that was even just to get to the place to understand the magnitude of it and how are other folks handling this this issue. Yeah. So, you know, had I just had my lens on and thought, I'm doing good. Down in Haiti, I'm doing good. Take a couple pictures head back home, you know, I wouldn't have been able to really see through it to understand that these paper medical records were a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I guess don't be afraid to fail, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it took us, you know, probably two and a half, three years to go from, you know, Devin saying, hey, do you think we could create this to, to deploying it? And uh, you know, there's a million speed bumps that are going to pop up and, and problems, and you just have to continue to be industrious and, and have a little bit of grit to push through that. Um, but, you know, if you stop when you start to hit some hurdles, then you're never going to make an impact. So It sounds like, Devin, you started as a medical student. There was a group going from Rush down to Haiti, and you just continued to go back because you wanted to help. Um, and is that the that was the impetus for creating Found, founding the Global Health Coalition. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you are you aware that Epic or other large EMR systems um, would offer their services to impoverished areas or places in need? I don't know. I can't speak on the behalf of those corporations, okay. right? Um, You're not uh, aware of efforts. I'm not aware of efforts. I, I do know that, um, like for example, um, Epic does give. Um, they allow free licenses for federally qualified health centers, um, mm -hmm. so FQHCs, which are um, uh, which are uh, provide uh, care to um, people in, in in impoverished communities within the U.S. that that can't really afford it. And so I know that there's there are some things that um, some of these vendors do locally about their international impact. I'm I'm just not educated enough to answer. And is Global Health Co Coalition strictly international, or are you looking at domestic areas? We had asked that a lot. Um, I, I think we'd be open to domestic areas, um, uh, particularly there's there's still uh, free health clinics that provide care to patients that are mm -hmm. underserved and uh, without health insurance, underinsured, and uh, I think it'd be a great utilization. We haven't gotten in that yet, so right now I think um, uh, once the word is spreading that we're doing this uh, and we're able to handle sort of small deployments, which is where these sort of bigger hospitals always start from, uh, we're, we're getting busy as mm -hmm. we are. So. Um as you talked about working with open surgery, um, mm -hmm. dealing with other other areas, um, do you see different barriers to implementing systems like these? Always. I mean, I think each deployment is unique because each community is uh, is different. Uh, the way it's structured, the way the healthcare will be, will be delivered, and sort of the needs of the system. So I think those challenges, the on the ground challenges, then translate to sort of a software and technical challenge. Um, it's always solvable, but I think it takes time to try to understand it. Um, and I think more so than that, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging thing to provide care. I think, it, you know, in Haiti, most recently, the political strife uh, had grounded uh, planes from uh, commercial flights from, from going in. And, and things were really bad for, for a while. And that changed what we did. And so sort of, um, you know, it made us have to work locally a lot more than we were because we weren't able to get things in and out. And so responding to that sort of dynamic type process is, is an ongoing challenge. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd add to that is uh, I think there's a lot that we want to be prescriptive with, uh, you know, things that we think would be important um, for for some for some of the partners that we're working with um, to adopt, like standardized, you know, key performance indicators and things like that. Um, and sometimes, you know, that's just not on their priority list. And so, um, with power generation innovation like solar and wind, mm -hmm. have you 
discuss with engineers other ways to help with yeah. power issues? Yeah. yeah. So we, we go back and forth over this one a lot because uh, it's becoming such a growing field of technology. Um, we, so we actually, um, we, we found a, a small company out of, out of Boston that um, was aware of the EMR. They were, uh, one, of their, one of their guys was part of the development team uh, for an early electronic medical record in a, in a global health clinic. And, and we found this device that we're testing right now that is, um, you kind of just put it on the wall and it's solar powered and it can supply sort of the electronic medical, medical record, which would be a really interesting sort of development for us because we could take it in places that we really haven't been able to even further away from a power source mm -hmm. uh, like a city. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the one thing that I'll say that, that popped up as we were looking at like solar is, um, you know, if we put solar where we were in Haiti, somebody would have stolen the solar panels in the middle of the night, um, you know, unless we put them really, really high up, you know, um, uh, or, or, or defended them in some type of way. Uh, additionally, you know, um, it, you have to make sure that that deployment of renewable energy is just as straightforward and simple um, because if that breaks down, um, and you don't have any any backup power, then your system is 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 for not. And so, we would love to. Uh, I think we we continue to go back to it, and we'll leverage it when it seems sustainable. Did you um, think about interoperability integration issues either with other facilities in Haiti, or um, you know when you go home, and and also where is the data stored? You have the, yep. the server, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so data is stored in uh, encrypted HIPAA. So there, um, we follow the exact same um, requirements that are um, that that protect patient data here in the United States. Um, there are not necessarily, uh, you know, our as we go into more and more countries, you know, there, uh, you know, there's um, we thought it would be immoral to not protect the patient data the same way that we would expect our data to be uh, protected here regardless of law. And so um, so we, we, we protect the, the data on um, HIPAA and uh, you know high trust servers that are um, that are encrypted. Um, and what was the first part of that question? Um, interoperability, integration oh, issues or things like that. Uh, we did Can not really think it? too much about interoperability or integration. So if integration with our platform is very easy to get outside data in. Um, the output of our data, um, we actually, it, it's, it's, it's relatively easy, but we deploy each one of these um, deployments as uh, kind of uh, an individual um, tenant. So it's, we, it's not like we deploy one code base and then everybody uses it. We're customizing this solution for, um, for the different locations. But the data that comes out all comes out in a standardized format, so it's easy for us to aggregate it if necessary. And on the patient level, I think, I think they're so far away from that on the ground in these rural areas that um, interoperability amongst a clinic and a hospital, for example, or a clinic and another clinic is really done just on a person-to-person on a -person level at this point. Did you develop it thinking, um, you know, talk about the simplicity of it and how that was helpful? Did you think about how it could evolve and, you know, as technology evolves, you could do other things with it or was that at the forefront at all or just get done what you could get done? Yeah, I, mean, I think we've went through a lot of iterations of thinking about um, how we could get to the most, uh, uh, the most data points that are the most significant to make the largest impact. Uh, and we keep going through that uh, and, and that's a challenging one. And so uh, we've toyed with ideas like, and it's currently being done by One World Surgery in the Dominican Republic, is actually going out with tablets and computers to take real population data, so a real public health approach to a population before building a health system, um, which we thought was a very unique thing. And so we're going to be involved with the data aggregation and analytics of that. Um, so before they even begin to build their clinic and hospital, they're understanding who these people are and uh, what sort of issues they have in terms of determinants of health. And in, in for me, when I th thought about you know future impacts, I always thought about you know uh, machine learning, uh, you know AI automating, you know the diagnosis, helping community workers, you know potentially get information about diseases into patients' hands so that they could be educating them in these rural areas, getting them information and knowledge that they'd never otherwise have access to. And that's all driven off of the data that we're collecting, right? And so um, for me, it was always, if we collect the right type of health and uh, data, then we can support 
implementing machine learning or AI algorithms to try to help um, uh, uh, per, you know, provide assisted or augmented care to some of these community workers on the ground, um, and then and then that third-party data that would come in from um, from other devices, more diagnostic type data that would make that uh, the picture of that patient richer. Yeah, and so that was one of the other questions. You know, are there times you wish you collected more data than like the stripped down initially? Uh, I mean. Uh, we haven't found. I, I don't think too many thing, too many questions that we've wanted to answer that we haven't been able to with the data at hand yet. Um, you know, it's it's. I would say I would sac. Uh, if if we did run into that, I'd be happy that we sacrificed some of that data for the simplicity. Because if people stop using the system, then you have no data at all. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have just a time for maybe a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, one is, how do you fund your efforts? And do you um, take volunteers? Do you need volunteers? We always need volunteers. And, uh, What's the best uh, way for people to help out? Or how should they get information? Uh, they could reach out to myself or, okay. or Devin uh, directly, um, or reach out to us uh, via the website. Um, and then uh, corporate and individual um, uh, donations is really what kind of you know, fund, our, fund our efforts. So. Great. I think we saw, I saw one more question back yeah. there, yeah. So I work for the State Department, and I've been part of expeditionary diplomacy for a long time. Like, I just got back from Bujabura, working with the ambassador on the Ebola crisis coming out of the DRC. And expeditionary medicine is like a part of all that's going on over there. And I was just wondering if you have worked in conjunction with the World Health Organization or with, you know, the migratory companies that, that have kind of pioneered this stuff because like you know go zeros put out really good solar power that's portable mm -hmm. 20 years ago and i just wondered if you guys have other people that you're working with templates to test not just your emr against but the logistical problems that you the challenges that you come across yeah in yeah. these ravaged areas yeah yeah i think we're we're continuing to to seek more partners and uh and, and try to break those barriers um, it, from a practical standpoint, it becomes uh, so difficult when you're entrenched in one area and you're w working with those partners locally. Um, what we found is that as we try to build things outside the U.S. and then try to make them sustainable in a certain area, uh, that we really need to engage the people there to find solutions that'll work. So that's what we've been focusing the majority of our efforts on now. Um, I think uh, the solutions and the ideas you bring up are important because uh, the Goal Zero technology and, and all of that, it, it's, a, it's amazing. We need access to it. We need access to it at a low cost, you know, and then we need access to the experts that are going to help us sort of grow, grow things to the next level. And so I hope that as we continue to do the important work we are in these small areas, you know, that we'll be able to uh, meet the needs of these larger organizations and some of their missions and, and try to align with them. Uh, most recently, some of our efforts are being funded by uh, Lurie's Children's Hospital. And uh, that was, a, that was a, a nice connection and um, uh, sort of an arm of, uh, of United Healthcare, which was so, so having access to those types of organizations, I think, is the start of, of what, you're, what you're mentioning. And hopefully, it will be the evolution of a, of a small nonprofit from Chicago. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yeah, having thank you, you guys. For thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah.